So this is a, an open GitHub repository. It's a CSDMS SPIN repository. The, the, these notebooks live there um, for people in the community to pull from too, as examples. Um, some of them may like undergo like a little bit of improvement still, um, but the teams will explain to you what their contributions are. So Team Snowflow. Hello. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much. And I guess I'll start off by thanking the CSDMS team as well as Espen, who really delivered a great learning experience for all of us and really helped us through. And also thank you to Jian, who like whose model we use, and she was also incredibly helpful. So uh, we are the team Snowflow. So we are kind of like this Pokemon up here. Um, so in this group, I am Karthike, and I'm uh, going to start this off. Uh, other members in the team, we have Carlos, Alex, Lauren, and Caitlin. And um, so basically when we started off this model or what was assigned to us sort of was to assess kind of the flood risk from uh, the overland flow model. But just like my PhD, we started off with something and sort of ended up with something else. So we, what we ended up doing was uh, kind of include another input into the overland flow model and which was to include the snow melt. And to calculate that snow melt factor, we wanted to do it as a function of temperature. So we included a degree day factor, DDF, as a general temperature over the entire basin, and then calculate the amount of snow melt that will be generated and contribute to the overland flow. Uh, so we have a number of steps here that we used or that we kind of followed. And I'm now going to ask my, my fellow member, Alex, to come forward and speak through the steps. Yeah, so the first step, like with all uh, programming, is to initialize your stuff. What you do, we use an API key to get a digital elevation model from open topography. This is a nice open source, open access, like uh, LIDAR data set. Here are all our libraries. You can read those later if you want. Here's the folders we made. So the, the first main, so the actual first step is to actually download a data set from open topography. We looked at a little valley near Boulder, uh, south of a city called Jamestown, Colorado. Uh, it had a fire a few years ago. So, so the original like uh, notebook was looking at how like that post fire, was looking at post fire uh, landslides and overland flow. Here it is. And now next we have to generate the snow melt. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren. Um, so one of the first things that we had to do as a team was determine snow melt. So our team looked at a number of equations online related to positive degree day, snow melting, and we found this equation that is within our notebook, melt rate. So that's DDF times temperature. DDF typically ranges from about three to five millimeters per day Kelvin. We decided to pick four <laughs> right in the middle. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that. Um, and so we had to convert temperature. So again, this is an educational Jupyter notebook to be used by undergraduates, for example. So I won't go into the details, but essentially we made a function that shows students how to convert and obtain that melt rate factor. Um, yeah, so more steps related to that. I will add that for this particular notebook, we use three cases of melt. So in order to show students what that would look like in an array, it prints out an array at the end of, as long as they follow those steps. Um, so that is it for us. I'll add in Carlos, who's going to give us a few comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, so a couple of comments about this model. So the idea of this overland flow is to you have the ocean to add some precipitation rate. So we consider also the uh how uh, the uh, the snow is melting how this precipitation rate changed so we are actually we are adding the effect of the rain and the snow melt so it's a very simple equation for calculating uh, the snow melt 
a couple of comments here. Obviously, the question comes from uh, energy surface balance. We're just calculating using the net radiation, the lighting heat flux, but the more important factor after reading a couple of pages in a book, we find out is uh, the latent heat flux is the, is the more important factor to determine this melt rate. And they um, they provided us very simple equation. Actually, it's only like in a factor as Lauren explained, and you need to select or choose a, a temperature. That is a temperature that, uh, above the, the zero uh, Celsius degrees. So after we do all that, uh, generate all the snow melt, we have to actually figure out, we actually actually get a watershed for the snow to flow through, which we do in this step. You can see a little like post-fire picture of the area. We set up a raster model grid, and then we do flow routing. And our watershed will come out of this point down here. It's also the largest watershed in the region, which you can see map up here. And actually just have to calculate overland flow. Hi, I'm Caitlin, and I'm going to talk about the simulations that we did with overland flow. So now that we have our watershed, and we have several different melt rates, and we also added in a bonus simulation where we said, what if snow was melting, but there was also precipitation happening at the same time? So with that, we created five different scenarios. Each of these scenarios runs for 200 minutes, and for the entire duration of those 200 minutes, there's either a heavy rainstorm happening, there's a heavy rainstorm with snow melt. So we take the snow melt calculated above, I think it was like the 0.5 degrees Celsius case, and we add that melt rate to the precipitation rate. And so that's our combined case, the second one. And then we did three cases where it's a sunny day, there's no precipitation, but we just have the melt rates that we computed above. So the, those were, yeah, they're like 45 millimeter, 46 millimeter simulations. So we ran all those in a for loop. Yeah, right. So these values, we have our three five cases. We have just rain, rain, and the 45.58 melt rate, and then the three different melt rates that would occur at those different temperatures. And then we can visualize our results. So in this first plot, you can see just the rain, the blue line, and then rain with the additional snow melt. And uh, you can see at the end of the 200 minutes, it starts to reach like a steady state. So we're like turning on the faucet of melt and precipitation. And then over time that like reaches like a steady state uh, flow at the outlet. And then our second plot compares our different melt scenarios on discharge. And so I think our main findings here was that although increasing the temperature does increase the amount of discharge, it's not by much. Like having something like precipitation and a warm day is much more likely to result in a flood than having just a slightly warmer day. Okay, and then we thought, okay, well, having a warm afternoon, that could happen. But usually like during spring melts, you get like many hours in a row that are above freezing. So we decided to run the model for 24 hours with, 24, with 12 hours of melt. And these videos don't embed on GitHub, but I, I tried this. And if it doesn't work, we'll just let it go. If I know how to play it, I will play it. So you can see a plot similar to those first three hours where uh, you get that initial peak and then it reaches steady state. It melts all day at that steady state. And then as it cools off in the evening, the discharge plummets. And we had a bunch of other, this one that I'm showing is for the 45 millimeter per hour melt rate. So like a just above freezing day, but we ran a bunch of other different ones with much higher melt rates. And you can find those in our GitHub repository. Um, so just to kind of tie a ribbon around that, uh, so we kind of modeled on a, the snow melt contribution to the overland flow under different conditions. On the shorter one, we show that adding snow, fell, uh, snow melt to the rainfall significantly increases the peak discharge 
Uh, it also reduces the lag time highlighted by the left shift that we saw in the hydrograph. Uh, we also isolated only the snowmelt component as well, and uh, we showed that the temperature didn't really change that much, like in terms of the peak discharge. Uh, the slight changes with the higher temperature kind of highlights, I think, the likelihood of generating more melt quicker with higher temperatures. Uh, sort of uh, to preempt the questions that we're going to get from the room, we we added what we could do. So we do understand that there can be spatial variations, especially with uh, differences in temperature and elevation over the basin. There would also be temporal variations, especially over the longer uh, model runs. Uh, we can switch to an hexagonal grid. We'll probably increase the accuracy. And uh, our original kind of aim to do flood vulnerability, maybe next time around when we come to CLGMS, we have that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can take that one. So that is a really, really high amount of relative melting. But that is the amount like during a really heavy, um, really heavy rainstorm. In the model that we borrowed from Tian, she was uh, uh, she had fifty five point two as her like heavy rainstorm amount. And in her simulation, she was only doing that for ten minutes. So that's like a deluge for ten minutes. But we thought, what if that happened for a whole entire hour? So that's fifty five millimeters right there. And then in our snowmelt model, uh, if we have a temperature of like just above freezing, that would generate a melt rate of 45 millimeters per hour. So we just added 45 to 55. <laughs> yeah. So you will see from these uh, um, presentations that like the peop people coming in actually with quite variable disc backgrounds and disciplinary knowledge as well. So the next team will be talking about landslides. Um, and um, yeah, come on, like, please come on up. I'm a Shawnee Long Reed and I'm tasked with existing or projects. But before I oh, sorry. But before I begin, I want to talk, thank the CSDMS team and all our mentors throughout the week in Espen. Sorry, we're having issues. Okay. So our project is on landslide susceptibility calculations in Tuscany, Italy. I want to first mention that our landslide susceptibility project is modified from TN's um, existing landslide susceptibility use case. So to start off with the very basics, so what is landslide susceptibility? Landslide susceptibility is the likelihood that a landslide will occur based on certain conditions. And the conditions we chose to focus on was root cohesion and also soil saturation values. Um, here we present a Jupyter notebook that uses similar concepts to the snow melt team, where we download topographic and so soil data from the CSDMS um, data components. And our next step is to calculate landslide susceptibility with root cohesion values and then to calculate landslide susceptibility with root cohesion value and also variation in soil saturation um, scenarios. So why Tuscany? Why Italy? We chose to focus on Tuscany, Italy because one of our group members is doing research in Tuscany, Italy. 
And we um, chose to apply this model to a real life scenario of heavy rainfall period in September of 2017. Hello everyone, um, my name is Selena. I'm at the University of Oregon. Um, next, as you heard from the previous group that um, these are labs, so we focus on learning objections and key concepts. Um, and again, like Ashani said, um, we focus on changing uh, root cohesion um, using uh, values we got from literature. Um, and then the second part of that, we varied both uh, and we plotted some really nice susceptibility maps. Um, and then from there, we want to focus on students really um, learning how to use these data components from CSCMS, um, Land Lab, all that good stuff. Um, scroll down a bit. And then, uh, like I said, it's very much organized in a, a lab setting. But we go through getting API keys so they can access the data components uh, for open topography, excuse me, um, and then get them to load up their packages, create folders, where to save things. Um, and yeah, and now on to the next. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sharad. So uh, we, so kind of, this is, uh, is not what we prepared. Yeah, this is not what we prepared. This is from a paper like we found, but this is the actual area. And we kind of selected from like somewhere area, somewhere up here in the uh, north side of Tuscany. Uh, we used whole like uh, uh, open topography data for uh, like downloading the digital elevation model. We calculated, uh, these are the, all the details of related to DM. And then, uh, the, the DM TIFF file has been brought up into like a raster grid model from the land lab. So all the further kind of so this, this is in the land lab. And uh, we, we also, we downloaded like uh, soil depth data from uh, soil grids, which is at 250 meter resolution. And then we calculated slope, uh, slope grid, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then because all the data components are from different spatial resolutions. So we used ES, ES, uh, ESPY, like uh, this is a weather related repository Python package, which kind of provides a regrader function to kind of regrade all the, the data to a specific like, same resolution. So we, our DEM is at 30 meter resolution. So all the data component, all the data has been re resampled to 30 meter using this regrading function. Yeah. Now, Estefania will talk about it. Uh, yeah, Hi. I'm Estefania. So the next part is the core of like what the students should be looking at, that it's landscape susceptibility. So first of all, we define what the factor of safety is. So we use like the formulation by Bill in 1995 that doesn't have like these clumped um, cohesion. That, and it separates root cohesion from soil cohesion. And we're doing that because we want to see, like use this root cohesion as a proxy for vegetation cover. So yeah, like overall, like this explains to students how to do that. And the susceptibility is defined here as one over the safety, the, the factor of safety. Yeah, we have had comments about that. And it like numerically, like if we only do the factor of safety, we get a lot of errors. So we're using the susceptibility as this. It might be confusing because the students are learning like factor of safety as resisting forces over driving forces. So it's between zero and one. And then the susceptibility is exactly the opposite, like the numbers. But anyway, keep in mind, we're looking at susceptibility. So we are varying root cohesion. Uh, here, we're just defining the plot thing. Uh, here, we just define these ranges of values for root cohesion that we found in the Tuscany area between 3,000 and 12,000. The units are pascals times kilograms over meter squared seconds. And yeah, we just, we're just changing different root cohesion values. And the results are this, like for really low root cohesion, this is just only changing root cohesion. We see that there's a lot, like within this landscape, there's a lot of susceptibility for most of the area. As a, and as root cohesion increases, it 
starts to obviously decrease and the landscape is more stable. And finally, we get like to the highest value we get for root cohesion that that would mean like a pretty solid vegetation cover. And we only have like really high areas that probably it's driven by slope. And yeah, now Sarah. Hey, I'm Sarah, I'm from Vanderbilt. Um, so the next part we were kind of thinking in a pedagogical way, like obviously from that equation above, there's multiple variables playing with one another. So we can do a really basic kind of showing how two variables might be competing or working together. So we're varying root cohesion with soil saturation and we keep it in a really simple for loop, just step, stepping through a saturation of zero, saturation of 50% and then a full saturation where your um, water depth is the same as your soil depth, just to show that root cohesion can't actually overcome different parameters. So it's in a simple for loop and also here, um, kind of doing a lot nicer plotting to show students like an example of how you can do kind of a pretty complicated plot. Um, so here we have the rows are our uh, root cohesion values and the columns are saturation values. And you can pretty nicely see there's a competition um, where so low saturation and low root cohesion, very little areas are experiencing high susceptibility. But as we increase saturation, a lot of the landscape um, will be susceptible, especially at those higher slopes. And then as we increase uh, saturation and increase root cohesion, you know, that root cohesion is balancing with the saturation, but we still have um, increased area that has a high susceptibility. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and then we just wanted to kind of make it easier for people to see um, relative to the actual landscape. So we added in our raster hill shading, um, kind of doing the same thing again, this time just using a different type of grid. And here we see the actual relief with those areas mapped on top. Um, yeah. And similar, but we didn't put it in the gridding space. Um, Uh, and, and also like uh, there is an option like uh, we have not run it, uh, we have kept it like kind of uh, student to ex experience it like later on, experiment it later on. So we can also download the, the era five data and we are using like total uh, total moisture there and, and, and soil moisture at different depth So from this. And at last like the data is 0 0.25 degree across 0 0.25 degrees. So we need to regrid this data and just need to run the code above to like kind of get the accessibility in terms of in case of real time like uh, rainfall conditions yeah so these are the references and just for the sake of students what we have created like to just to see that okay the there is a fact of regrading uh, so we have created a, a report like files showing that okay if you use such like this is your original data and if you are kind of using regrading different kind of so what will be the effect of regrading on the final outcomes so this is just it and our kind of repositories is is very much complete uh, it contains like literally everything starting from key concepts literature study area description properties and like even inventory of the landslide locations and our ethnologies thank you Um, our, our next team, um, two teams, they were all interested in effects of vegetation and ecology on landscapes, but they were a very large team and they had different interests. So they broke into sort of two, like split into two branches. Um, and so we'll hear first from the team that works on like river or worked on river meanders and uh, vegetation effects.
<laughs> this one for sure. Okay. Oh, this is loud. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Huke. I'm from the University of Idaho. Um, Hello, everyone. I'm Noshin from Penn State. I'm Nick Korak from Wake Forest University. Mike, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Oxford. Uh, so first, I want to congratulate the first two groups that came before us. Those are really, really awesome work. Um, ours is a little bit shorter, uh, <laughs> so a little bit humbled. Um, we are the migrators. We chose this group name because we were interested in the effects of vegetation and river migration and meandering. So just like as a brief introduction to what we have been doing is that we know that channel migration is controlled by so many factors such as channel morphology, flow conditions, sediment transport, but it also is controlled by bank resistance. And so plant, plants, vegetation densities, um, make the banks um, more resistant, um, hence harder to erode. So we wanted to demonstrate this through a um, numerical model um, using a Python module called MeanderPy, authored by Zoltan Sylvester. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, which was based on this uh, very simple model from the paper of Howard and Knudsen in 1984, which basically does a very simple link of the curvature of the river, so the original morphology and the migration rate. So first I'm gonna give a demonstration of the original MeanderPy um, module. These are the input parameters. Um, it has a ton of assumptions such as like constant width, the depth, um, and it only changes the migration rates laterally. Um, so first we're gonna do a example of a low vegetation density. And the way that we wanted to account for this vegetation is through um, the friction factor, in this case, the Chizzy coefficient. Um, because we know they're not directly related, but we know that when we have higher roughness, um, they're gonna be slower velocities. And so the erosion rates are going to be lower. So for low vegetation density, we're assuming that we're gonna have higher rotability, so a higher Chizzy factor. Um, and this is how we initialize the model, we run it, and this is one of the results that we get. So we can see that it has a lot of cutoffs and a lot of oxbows, which represent basically where the river has been historically. So if you're on the same one, changing the Chizzy factor now, to a higher vegetation density um, or a lower erodibility, if you will. Um, we can see now that we have much less oxbows and a more stable, or not stable channel, but you, you can see what I mean. Anyways. So in order to show how this mineral reverse moves across the uh, landscape, we have prepared a small video. So here you can see the blue a dark line is the actual current active river and the uh, light blue river actually light blue parts are actually the cutoffs made by the river. So here we have used a, a higher choosing fraction that or higher factor values that indicates higher irritability. That means low vegetation and low stability of the bank. So that generates lots of cutoffs as you can see in both sides. So for the last couple of examples, we've had one Chazy factor. So our first mission was um, originally going to be create like a varied landscape and, and have multiple types of factors throughout the grid. Um, but first, we, we needed to start with uh, just seeing if we could implement two different Chazy factors, um, one on the, the north bank and one on the south bank. Um, and so we began this by um, you know, forking the repository and then creating our own branches and started editing code. Um, and here we have um, two different types of uh, vegetation um, densities on the north and south banks. So we have a um, two different Chazy factors. And the uh, after running this model simulation, you can see we have lower vegetation density um, and therefore uh, more erodibility on the north bank. And so you can see a lot more cutoffs in these blue um, uh, the blue markings here. And then on the south side of the river, we had a higher um, density, vegetation density, and so there were less cutoffs. Um, and we wanted to maybe make this even more varied, but we'll we'll get to those issues in a little bit. Um, so for right now, we can just consider everything on the north bank one 
unified type of vegetation and on the south bank a different kind of vegetation thank you yeah so and looking at that plot i'm sure we are not the only people in this room who find it very unsatisfactory to say oh yeah the north bank looks kind of different than the south bank we like numbers and um, so we thought about how can we kind of um, use metrics to compare the north bank with the lower vegetation density to the, to the south bank and a very obvious one that we created this little cell for is to just calculate the number of cutoffs that we have in the north versus the cutoffs in the south. And um, so what we're doing uh, is we were iterating through the cutoff objects and looking at the coordinates. Um, and, and if the coordinates were mainly in the north, and then those would be calculated for the north bank. And if they were mainly in the south, they would be calculating for the south bank. And so looking at that plot again. Um, so for this particular plot, what we got was a uh, was 126 cutoffs in the north versus 27 in the south, which is, I guess, a um, pretty distinctive difference. And then as Nick has already said, um, we would actually like this to be a bit more complicated even because um, it's not very re realistic, I guess, that we have one kind of vegetation on the North Bank and one kind of vegetation on the South Bank that are um, very distinctive and not varied at all. So the next step, um, I'm not sure if we're going to continue on this project, but, but if we ever did, we would want to um, create some kind of more realistic vegetation with maybe random vegetation patches of, say, three different kinds, for example, shrubs versus trees versus grasses. And we've already started to create um, nice grids for that, but we haven't managed to implement that into the model. Yeah, and I think that's that's all from us. If you have any questions, we're ready to answer them. So that was one of the difficulties is like, can we evolve the Shazi factor to move with the, the and, and we were unable to implement that. So it's kind of relative to what was existent in the grid on the north half and the south half. Yeah. That, that's correct. Yeah, the, the Shizzy factor, it was implemented just as a kind of a constant value throughout. And so now we've had added at least the spatial component to it. So the next group of SMIN maybe can build on that. So the other vegetation group uh, will be presenting their um, codes. And you'll see that uh, um, they took a very different approach. So it will be something very different for students to like look at. Good morning, everybody. I am Madoshe, and my group will be presenting vegetation dynamics. You know, uh, normally or traditionally, how we model flow resistance is just assigning a constant vegetation. But since some decades, there is a lot of efforts to see how we can actually capture the impact of vegetation and flow resistance. And there is some models like XBH of Delft 3D that is applying uh, the approach of Baptist, where you have two flow regime submerge. And after that, you have a more logarithmic profile when the 
uh, water depth, it's higher than the vegetation height. The main characteristics that we use to module vegetation, it's as a cylinder. So we take stem density, number of stem per square meter, uh, stem height and stem diameter. And you may see that this is the expression from Baptiste. This is the value of GAZ based on vegetation dynamics. And here, this is the three parameters. It is vegetation height, density, and some kind of drug coefficient also. And you may see we'll have like two value. So the second hand of that equation, if that value of the logarithmic gets lower than one, we'll have negative value. So we need to separate uh, that formula and let's say two size depends on if the vegetation height it's lower or higher. We'll be using this later on in the model in the let's say implementation of that Baptist formula. I will explain that. So the main objective was to see how using a constant roughness and using the varied uh, roughness impacts the discharge at a given outlet or <clears throat> overall water depth. And for our study, we first input our, we imported a bunch of libraries and then set up our model raster and decided to keep this simple and used a, a test basin that's um, provided land lab and for the simulation we closed all the boundaries but introduced one node where we would have discharge flowing out uh, from the simulated area so for the constant mannings we defined a function that takes one um, value which is the mannings n value so for each vegetation type we're simulating three types of vegetation grass shrubs and trees the user can define the Manning's n based on literature. Um, and in this function, we redefine the grid and user can enter the n. One other thing we had to introduce was a rainfall intensity. So there's a constant rainfall intensity for the simulation. And um, within the same function, we have two lists that store the hydrograph data, so the time and the discharge. And at the end of the simulation, which runs for 500 seconds, uh, we also get the overall water depth at the end of the simulation. So at 500 seconds, we calculate the water depth. Okay, so this is uh, the Baptist formula. We just built our class. So like I mentioned you, and that equation we saw above, if the second part of the right hand side, it's being negative, we don't use it and we put a conditional statement if the vegetation height it's higher than the water depth we will just be using only the first part of the second hand of that uh, equation because if we don't do that we would have the case of you know negative uh, chasey so we use that approach and we will have a spatial temporal uh, uh, variability of the roofness which varies in time with the water depth and with varies also and space depends on the conditions. Here I have to say that I just, we just only assume one vegetation density for the world domain, but in a real world case, we would have to make kind of, you know, discretization depends on each, let's say, uh, 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 polygons of vegetation to define those kind of characteristics. All right, so we next built a function that would implement this formula of allowing for a variable um, roughness based on the vegetation and also the water depth. So it starts pretty much the same as our previous function. We set up some lists to store our data. We set up a time step and then we set up our grid um, the same. But then we add a uh, roughness um, at the, so we first add it at the node and then we translate it to links. And then when we initialize the overland flow model, we use um, that field of links to define our roughness. 
um, and then we loop through our time step, but then we also loop through every link and we use our two formulas to calculate a new roughness. And then we add that to um, the field and it goes on and on. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we ran uh, three different scenarios. Well, actually six, one with the constant M and one uh, with the variable Manning Zen. And we chose uh, grass, shrubs, and trees. And this is the um, input uh, vegetation information. Um, and so you'll notice um, chose the same Manning's N for shrubs and trees. And so here is how we ran our scenarios. And uh, oops. Yeah. hi, I'm Dominique. Um, I'll show you the results. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to do was plot the um, like a hydrograph for the final output point on our artificial. DEM. So here you can see we've got grass, shrubs, and trees, but you can only see two lines. And that's like Ira said, we only we use the same Manning's end for shrubs and trees, which was just taken from like an engineering manual probably. Um, the next thing that we did was um, plot again, but using our dynamic flow resistance, so using the Chazy number, which was first to um, And we've got a slightly different graph. Um, so you can see. Uh, still have the grass and the shrubs, so the shrubs are rougher, so they're um, resulting in a slower discharge. Um, but if you have a look at trees, trees are doing something weird. And trees are doing something weird because we plotted them as, or we, we inputted them as 10 meter elevation. We were like, oh, that will be fine. Um, but as you as you see in a minute, when we've got the water, sur water surface height, uh, we actually have water, so water depth of 20 meters. So these are really rough features, <laughs> um, which you can see in the instability at the beginning of the graph. Um, so yeah, so, and just to plot them alongside each other, um, you can see that there's a bit of a reduction in discharge rate with our, our varying uh, planning zone. Um, so yeah, so, just to sort of like explore that uh, weirdness of the trees a little bit more, um, we plotted the discharge rate against uh, the Manning N. Um, and sort of the first thing that's wrong with this graph is that the Manning's N value is really, really large for all of them, especially trees. Um, but what's right with this graph, if you look at the grass and we'll ignore trees for now. Um, for the grass and the shrubs, there is a negative relationship between Manning's N and the discharge, which suggests like as water, um, water elevations are increasing, we're getting less flow resistance, which is what we'd expect, which is good. Um, so yeah, so then we've just got a plot on the water depth. If we had a little bit more time, it would have been, this is just for the, the constant N for grass. We would have also liked to have got constant N for shrubs and trees, and then also done uh, the, the varying N, um, and then subtracted those, so we could have got a difference, but we sort of just ran out of time. <laughs> but something that we will improve for the next bit. Um, and then kind of, yeah, just to finish off, uh, like, so what? Um, like, Uh, this is just some figures, sorry. Um, yeah, like. Right, right. It's basically just some figures showing that um, some like snips from like the internet showing that um, we're really interested in roughness. Like, why have we done a why have we done like a workbook on this? It's so like students can understand like the importance of like varying roughness. Um, there's a huge amount of research in like how uh, like vegetation can attenuate waves and like how it can change like bank erosion, like the other uh, overland flow groups. Um, and yeah, so yeah, um, yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>
So this year, this year we had um, a few people interested in glaciology and glacier systems. And so we quickly assembled the team glaciers. Um, that's not a tradition. A traditional like set of notebooks that they could pull off like very quickly so they had to be a little bit creative with what kind of problems they uh, wanted to uh, start on and work on um, and I'll let you tell them. Cool thank you Rita um, but yeah just to echo that we're like one of the first glacier groups. And so we like to thank Arena and Ethan for guiding us um, towards something feasible and also encouraging us to do something really cool and fun. And so this is something targeted toward grad students or also undergrads um, and understanding how meltwater um, will change over different kinds of surface topography and what the resulting meltwater production and firm presence is like. And so I'd like our team members to introduce themselves and their glacier interests. So my name is David. I am interested in hydrology. I am from Wake Forest University. Hi, I'm Emily. I go to Columbia and I'm interested in ice shelf stability in Antarctica. Hello, I'm Noreen. I'm from SUNY Buffalo. I am working on crevasse detection on the Greenland ice sheet. Hi, I'm Jonas. I'm from Simon Fraser and I work on periglacial landforms. So don't like glaciers that much actually, but... And I'm Michaela. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin, and I look at glacial sediment transport under glaciers. Um, and so to start us off, I wanted to start with this image, especially for those that might not think about glaciers all the time like us. Um, so this is the A Glacier in Banff, Banff National Park, and this is showing like just a large amount of water discharge on glacier surfaces. And so why do we care about surface hydrology? Um, about a third of our entire population lives within glacier water resources. And so it's super important to know when, where, and why these um, this water content will be released from glaciers. And also, if you haven't been convinced from Alex's talk yesterday, it's super important to understand this very complex system, especially looking at this figure and how much water is coming from glaciers. And also just understanding climate and stability in the future and evolution of these glaciers. So super important. I hope you can agree too. Um, so yeah, a lot of our motivation is to use our approach to understand the different kinds of surface topography, starting with something synthetic or idealized that our team created and then understanding it in a real glacier case. And so Emily will start us off with a synthetic one and then we'll go into one case for a real glacier. Awesome. Thanks, Michaela. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, of course, we started with our imports. The only part I'll talk about here is that we, we created a glacier surface flow class that we imported here that incorporates a few of the different land lab modules. And then to start off, we wanted to run our flow accumulator tool on a channel synthetic glacier. So we tested this on a few different synthetic glaciers. We made a fun parabola, we made a nidome. But for the purposes of today, we're just going to talk about our channel topography. So this is what it looks like. It's just a simple two-dimensional sloped topography. And then we kind of incised this idealized channel through the center of the topography to make sure that our flow accumulator tool was working. Um, so the very first thing we did is just a simple plot of the drainage area without considering differential meltwater production. So this rule, or excuse me, this tool works by assuming the glacier is melting kind of at the same rate homogeneously everywhere. And then this is a plot of the relative drainage area represented by the blue to yellow color bar in each grid cell. So as expected, you can see as we move from the high part of the glacier down to the low part, it's getting yellower, there's more meltwater accumulating. And then also in the channel, we can see that there's a lot more meltwater than elsewhere on the glacier. And then the white arrows are, of course, showing the flow direction. And this was created with the flow director D8 algorithm, which simply looks at each grid cell and then looks at the eight adjacent grid cells and determines which way the water will flow based on the direction of steepest descent. So then to add a little bit of realism into our model, we wanted to incorporate heterogeneous melt production. And we started with this kind of very extreme case of, okay, what if there is this one random grid cell that was melting at a rate of 10 times faster than everywhere else on the glacier? What would this mean for our relative flow accumulation? And you can see here with the same channel topography, it kind of worked as expected, so we still have our channel with the most meltwater accumulation, but then you can also see that downstream of where we're producing extra melt, there's extra melt accumulation, as you would expect. 
And then one more step we wanted to take to try and make our model a little more realistic was to incorporate the presence of fern. So for those that, like Kayla said, don't think about glaciers all the time, fern is essentially snow that has fallen on top of a glacier but hasn't had time to compact or densify into glacial ice yet. So this means that there's a lot of air content within fern where meltwater can kind of percolate into and refreeze. And this is significant for glacial flow because if there's fern present on a glacier, it will slow meltwater accumulation because instead of flowing downstream, the water will instead just sink into the uh, sink beneath the surface. So Jonas is going to talk about how we did this. Yes. Yeah, so just to kind of show in an idealized case why this might be important, um, what we did was we created um, binary fern presence, which is basically just above a certain elevation. We said there is fern, and below it there isn't. So. That's why you see here basically one at the high elevations, no fern, low, and then the channel doesn't have any. And we use the lossy flow accumulator, which basically allows you to add a function that says um, that we're losing some amount of our discharge. And just to, because we've really pumped up the numbers quite a bit, we initially tried to like do some rough scaling based on Darcy's law and use that to get like a constant um, loss rate. Turns out with the numbers we chose for a synthetic case, that meant we basically lose nothing. So we just decided to add a couple of orders of magnitude. <laughs> um, and the picture then looks like this. So we again get less, but we still get most of our surface water discharge in this channel that we created. But this giant peak that we had initially, we now actually see that downstream of that, there isn't that much more um, meltwater accumulating because most of it would percolate into the fern here. So this kind of just shows why this is important and why people might want to like look into this. Um, yeah, so we now have a bit more realistic case. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the real case and we chose a glacier in the Andes. It is a glacier on a structural volcano. Uh, the name of this glacier is Chimborazo. And I will download the data for the digital elevation. Uh, from the shuttle radar topography topography mission. And here it is. It is a digital elevation model in a 3D dimensional plot. And then we just plotted it again in a two dimensional plot to then match and identify the flow channels for this glacier. And here you see the, the channels. What we did is just max out all the flow channels that had, that were sinking in the same spot and uh, and, ha, and that was like the, those points with the drainage area of the 10 percent and below and then we try to add a, to add melt production with the era 5 and what we did to match the spatial resolution about is using the gaussian filter here and that's something where actually things started going wrong because the model, <laughs> the model that we created before they, they didn't show any changes in the in the topography of this of the, of the real case and that's something that we have to work and improve for future projects. And now Noreen will tell you the conclusion of the next steps. Um, so in conclusion, we explored how meltwater routed, meltwater is routed across glacier, glaciers for a synthetic case and a real life glacier case. We also visualized how differential meltwater production can impact glacial routing. And we found that it's important to know where meltwater production sources are originating from or if they're localized, uh, since we see in the synthetic glacier case that meltwater is occurring, meltwater occurs in places outside of the channel. And um, we also found that the presence of fern can slow surface water accumulation. And finally, we provide an initial framework of including um, meltwater and fern processes for glaciers, including the in the land lab infrastructure. Um, for future steps, we would like to explore flow accumulator, um, how it works for ice sheet surfaces. We would also like to incorporate a more robust representation of the fern layer. And we also want to add our classes to the land lab framework. Thank you. Thank you.
I I wanted to give a quick shout out to Tian, who like helps the students a lot by like providing these data components to make their cases a little bit more like unique, like the Chimarazzo, like topo pooling topography from a specific place that some team member has an affiliation with, or that is their research um, area. And so, I don't know, like two more like assistant professors told me this morning that that was valuable to them and maybe to their classwork or um, et cetera. But I think these notebooks show some of that too, that there there is fun in illustrating against real time data or like real um, data that comes from these data components. With that sidetracked, <laughs> Um, I wanted to like pull up, pull, pull, um, ask the last team to like come forward. This is a team that was interested in a bit longer time scales, um, and they've been exploring the effects of rainfall patterns on mountain ranges. Hey guys, we're the last group. And we wanted to look at the effect of the orographic effect on topography. So as a bit of background, <clears throat> the orographic effect is how um, basically rainfall changes as you move across a mountain range. So why this happens is that when you get, um, there's a prevailing wind uh, that usually most of the weather is coming in from. And as the air is forced over the mountain range, um, it cools and releases a lot of precipitation. And this causes an effect where you have an increase in precipitation with elevation. So that's the first thing that we're gonna show you guys about. And the second thing is that as the uh, air continues to move across the crest and it releases all its precipitation, it dries out and warms up as it moves down. And this creates a rain shadow or a lack of precipitation on the far side of the mountain range. So to preempt some comments here, I think that this, <laughs> the way that we did this uh, modeling was, uh, I would call it a thought experiment as opposed to realistic. And um, yeah, we just wanted to play around to see with what sort of topographies we could come up with. So we put together a notebook that demonstrates uh, how we incorporated the orographic effect into the linear diffusion component and stream power fastscape eroder components. Um, and so we developed a relationship relating uh, precipitation to elevation. And for the fastscape eroder component, we um, included this relationship in the water influx field. Um, and for the linear diffusion component, we came up with kind of a linear relationship between. Um, the diffusivity constant and relating that um, to precipitation. So first uh, we created a synthetic grid uh, with randomized variation in topography. And then we applied these two components for um, a 60,000 year time scale. Um, and so in this first example, we're showing uh, constant precipitation. So this um, is the example with no orographic effect. Um, developing uh, channels and hill slopes with the highest point in topography um, uh, accumulating around the middle of the grid and the highest elevation shifting through time um, as uh, the landscape is eroded. And so this plot shows how we applied a, a constant precipitation without an orographic effect. And so as we can see from the resulting landscape, that the river profiles are um, pretty overall pretty smooth and uh, concave up, and that the uh, elevation of the final uh, topography um, shows kind of a east to west uh, increase in elevation. So now we apply. Uh, the orographic effect to our grid. And so in this scenario, precipitation increases as elevation uh, increases. So as you can see, the 
point of highest elevation is moving around the grid. And this is the result of kind of this feedback loop between increased uh, elevation due to increased in, uh, precipitation eroding. Um, and as a result, we see um, interesting river profiles with kind of uh, steeper, steeper cutoffs. And we also see the development of these mesas uh, below the uh, ridge line, so the point of highest elevation. So now when we apply the rain shadow to our grid, that excludes the orographic effect. So in this case, um, where Yeah, so to apply the rain shadow, we um, jury rigged it to basically just uh, cut precipitation to a very low value at the other side of the ridge crest. Um, so that's what you're seeing here, where there's a pretty abrupt change from high precipitation to low precipitation. Um, and it creates some sort of interesting topographies here, where we have a, a very different um, north slope than uh, our south slope and a lot more diffuse on the north slope. Right, and we can see a huge difference in the river profiles between the north slope and the south slope here, where um, these jagged ones are being affected by the rain shadow. As you can see here. And some extremely wacky swath profiles. Um, here in our last simulation, we're applying both the rain shadow and our orographic precipitation rule. I think maybe that was the last GIF actually, but let's we'll see if there's a difference here. Um, yeah, and we see in all of the simulations with a, a rain shadow that the divide migrates towards the area with the rain shadow. And that is something that we do see in the Sierra Nevada where our, our ridge is pretty heavily towards that side. And we see um, the development in terms of topography, kind of this high uh, ridgeline mountain front with uh, kind of this flatter mesa topography and then a decrease um, within the windward side. <laughs> 